you, Ralph. Thank you all. So I encourage you to uh, follow me on Twitter there. I, uh, I, I like to live tweet, and yesterday was alive with activity from Bitbucket Pipelines. Uh, but this is not that story. This is, this is my story. Uh, my story begins about uh, right after Summit last year in December. I was working on a small team, and we were focused on trying to get more continuous integration and continuous delivery integrators, not just with pipelines. We want people to have choices. And uh, we wanted to use the Connect framework. And so we were finding that uh, you know, we're, we're reaching out to these different customer or these different vendors and trying to get them to uh, com come on board, start connecting with us. But let me step back from my own story here and put this build integration idea into context from a, a short historical perspective. So if you were one of the cool kids three years ago, you might have wired up Bamboo to HipChat and, f and found how great it is to start getting those build messages in the, in the chat context that you're already using. So this is a classic screenshot of older hip chat. And uh, it seemed like such a breakthrough, right? I mean, you start getting notifications, and, 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 and you know, everybody starts to know what's going on with these builds. And then you start wanting more. So you start wiring up Bamboo to Bitbucket, and Bamboo to Confluence, and Bamboo to Jira. And it's, it's a wonderful situation to have. Connection to Bamboo helps make sure that all of these tools put the, uh, like the agile principle in practice, measuring progress in terms of working software. So it's really important. Integration is out of the box for Atlassian products. So for most of you, this is good. But there are some of you uh, that, that don't have Bamboo. And, and that's OK. We, we still think Bitbucket, HipChat, Jira, and, and Confluence are better with build integration. And it shouldn't mean that you must buy Bamboo, even if that's what we'd really like. So what happens if you are one of these unlucky persons who has to put uh, Jenkins in that spot instead of Bamboo? Well, it's, it's a mire of plugins. So to work well with Bitbucket alone, you need half a dozen plugins. Uh, there's probably a few more for Jira, and there's one for HipChat. I, I don't know, is there even one for Confluence? Uh, so, and, and like, while I'm picking on Jenkins, I, I'll be honest, right? It's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's easy to pick on because of its plugin overload, uh, but I hope you understand it's not just Jenkins. What about TeamCity, or what about this new generation of cloud build servers uh, that really don't have plugins at all? And so that's the group of servers that brings me back to my story. So there's a kind of pain point that different people feel with this need to do point-to-point -point integrations. Users feel the pain of connecting Jenkins to HipChat, Bitbucket, and Jira. You need dozens of plugins to make it work. Integrators are forced to choose among the products. So I go out to a, a vendor, and, and they tell me, like, oh, yeah, Bitbucket's interesting, but you know what? HipChat is really a higher priority for us. Oh, there's another miss for me. Uh, and Atlassian feels the pain, too. So all of you have heard the Bitbucket Pipelines announcement uh, now, and we need that to work with HipChat, Bitbucket, and Jira also. So, the solution that I propose here is, is that like, maybe it would be better if we had more of a hub-and-spoke approach. So Bamboo, or whatever build server, should just be like, have a standard message that it sends into this hub about there is a build that has happened. And it shouldn't need to worry about formatting that in any spe special way for all of the different tools that it's trying to talk to. So let each product has its, have, have its own way of understanding what it means to have a build happen or how it wants to present that information. But uh, take care of that somewhere else. Don't make Bamboo play that uh, individual role. And so if we have a solution like that, then let's look at that, how that solves those three problems that I set up. So the advantages for each of these audiences would be that users just install one Jenkins plugin, and they get HipChat, Bitbucket, and Jira all at once. Integrators don't have to choose which products. They would just use this kind of standard. And for Atlassian, our own products integrate with each other. But, but you already expect that. So it really means that we would have to push, or right now, we have to push more and more effort to the new guy. And so it allows us to really ramp up new products faster if we, if we have this kind of hub and spoke approach. So now that you understand the advantages, Let's take a closer look at what this hub and spoke implies for a technical architecture. 
So one of the important things is this idea that we would separate read and write. And this is one of the, uh, a big challenge for, for an architecture that's already uh, point to point where everything is expected on the same channels. So for the write channel, a build server has information about a build uh, that is just finished, so some kind of status, pass or fail. And instead of making it responsible for writing to each channel, we need a standard message that it would have that, that has the union of information that all of the channels need. On the read side, each HipChat, Bitbucket, and Jira are different perspectives on that build information. They want to put that into the context that's meaningful for that product. So ideally, we would teach each product how to read from the standard and then uh, and, and multiplex that way. But in this experiment, the one that I conducted here, uh, I have that responsibility in my own hub and spoke. So, uh, you know, so it, 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 it's, I think it still proves out the case. And while the separation is necessary for our hub and spoke model, uh, it's also good for distributed computing. The updates to each product are, are, not, are, are relatively independent, so there's no need to lock for a coherent update across all of the products. It's just uh, more asynchronous that way. So to achieve that, that there's this uh, idea of an architectural pattern, pattern known as command query responsibility segregation, or CQRS. And I first learned this pattern uh, from the .NET community. So I don't know how many of you are in that community, but it's, it's not so backward after all. Uh, so consider booking an airplane seat. I'll walk through a, a short example. For one person, it's, it's just atomic. You pick which seat you want, and, uh, and you, know, you, you can book right away. But if you're a passenger trying to book with a whole family, and some of you staying may, may be in this situation, you, you may want adjacent seats. And so as a developer, you could lock the seats per user, uh, but then each person has to query the source of truth before they pick the seats. And even then, it isn't, the user isn't guaranteed to get that particular seat that they've asked for. So also, the passenger becomes unintentionally greedy. So while you're trying to pick the seats that are adjacent, uh, that you, know, you, you end up holding these seats a little bit longer than you want. So, uh, so that, doesn't, that just doesn't scale very well. In CQRS, passengers sacrifice fine-grained control of each seat for a broader command. They express what their intent is uh, and that they want the four adjacent seats and then a kind of virtual agent. The, the, the system itself is responsible for finding uh, the appropriate match and, uh, and uh, giving those seats out. So that means a query confirms the result for the, for the agent uh, and, and that's a more transactional. And then in the airplane world, this means such a solution means the one you pick isn't always the one you get, uh, but at least you have a way to express the, the kinds of characteristics that you want about the seat, the aisle, window, seat class, or adjacency, or and sometimes you even don't get any of those. Uh, but even if your command is clear, the agent may be optimizing other things that you don't care about. And that's one of the things about CQRS that becomes a, a, a bit more complicated. But um, this is also related to uh, you know, another similar idea, event sourcing. Uh, for the right side, the general idea of this event sourcing, is, it's, it's really important and useful. So although you may have used similar patterns with an uh, enterprise service bus, the idea of event sourcing you know, has some similarities, but also some differences. Uh, in a sense, it's a lighter weight implementation. Uh, perhaps it's because a pervasive understanding of CAP theorem has led people to, to, to really realize that there's a lot of overhead in uh, the, the, uh, having one, one point that's an ESB, or uh, I don't know, the new generation of tools is just brighter and shinier, I don't know. Um, so the core idea of event source is that it has a strict order of events. And in CQRS, this is often important to uh, be able to take the commands on a first come, first serve basis. So that's, that's one of the ways that it arbitrates commands. But not always, that, that can vary somewhat. Because the events are ordered, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, any client can keep track of when it has last read and catch up by just saying, like, this is the last point in time that I've read and, and get all of the events that have happened since then. Uh, and there's a common limitation in these, in these streams that they are time-limited or time-boxed, which is, is, is the way that these are not 
uh, guaranteed delivery. And that's one of the big differences between the, maybe the older ESB approach. Uh, now, if the client doesn't catch up, you know, like it may lose events, but you have to decide if that's a problem for you. And, and in high, <clears throat> high, high frequency uh, applications, oftentimes that window is so wide that <clears throat> you'll never hit it. Um, anyway, if event so sourcing sounds familiar, it should. Plain old text logs follow this same kind of ordering protocol. And so to the extent that structured logs and event sourcing are, uh, are really just different terms for the same technology, so hence the, the name of this book. Uh, but it's a bit like how telco people say switches and network people say routers. Same difference. Um, OK, so for the read or query side, there are many different answers here. You know, Bitbucket has uh, this build status for each commit, so that's one read channel. HipChat has a, uh, a build message that you can put into the room history as a message. Uh, so it's another read channel, but you've also got glances or views that you can provide through Connect. Uh, and my own Connect add-on stores the information uh, as, as like a build status, plus the number of times since the last uh, build failed. And so those informations are, are both available as glances or, or could be written as Connect add-ons into any of these products. So it's the job of my hub and spoke to turn each of those status commands that we get from the build server all into these read models or, or something that they can uh, be translated into in the connect world. Uh, and, and this can be a little off-putting at first. It goes against decades of database normalization rules. Uh, so you know, you've got this emphasis on don't repeat yourself in, in data. Uh, where this is almost completely opposite. Because this isn't a database, this is not an RDBMS, we're moving data to where it's needed and letting different services be the master of that information. Uh, and so if there is a notion of source of truth anywhere, it's really in the, the history of commands in the event store. Uh, yeah. so, and then eventually everything else is just a copy so it can force, focus on the slice of information that it needs. It's just like, uh, let's show the last build status as red or green, and it can ask one place for that. So event sourcing is also related to a couple other industry buzzwords, big data and complex event processing. And with all of these buzzwords, even you could sell CQRS to solve every problem in your organization, right? Well, beware the golden hammer. Uh, so you'll find that a lot of people agree with me that it's a great hammer for integration nails. But CQRS isn't a fit for every problem. Uh, one of the most significant costs is that it introduces additional technical complexity. So uh, let's go to AWS uh, to show why that kind of complexity exists. So the thing is, this is, you know, I don't need all of the AWS services, but I want to start here to show you how fine-grained AWS services are. And not only are there different services for different architectural functions, there are often multiple services within each category. And so that's some of that complexity that I was talking about. Uh, so there are each pros and cons with different styles. But I'll walk you through some of the ones that I used and how I composed these services. So we'll start with Bamboo, so, or whatever build tool. And it emits a webhook to uh, express a build event, like the, the build started, or the build passed, or the build failed. And then the event. Uh, is a payload that carries a set of rich information in, in a, an HTTP. Uh, so who started the build and for which repository and where to find more information about the build results. Uh, and that's caught by the uh, AWS API gateway, which handles things like rate limiting and, and validating the, the payload that, that comes in. And then that turns around and sends, uh, a, a kind of aggregates all of the information from headers and from uh, the URL path and from the payload and puts it into one, con uh, one message that it then sends on to AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda is, is uh, you might call these microservices, uh, some have called them nano services. It's really just a short block of uh, functional code that takes that message and can do something with it with other AWS services or make calls out to the web. In my case, I send, I do some processing on that original message and make a decision about what kind of information to store. So I'm just gonna pull out, like, if this was the latest, uh, you know, uh, uh, build status or, or, or make a count of the number of 
times that, uh, since the last build failed, and write that into Kinesis as a command. So that's uh, really just passing that information through so the command is now available on a, on a kind of queue. So this provides a, a whole lot of scaling. Now let's turn around and look at how this uh, works when I want to uh, uh, read from it. So we take this command, we send that back uh, over to yet another Lambda. This Lambda's job is responsible for writing some information into a DynamoDB. And so this is really the, the, you know, the store of information about uh, like what's the current build status for a given job or how many builds have, have there been since the last failure. And now let's look at how, how, how different add-ons would read from it. So we might start from a HipChat Connect add-on uh, using a glance. It makes an HTTP request, a GET in this case. Uh, again, we hit the API gateway in AWS. Uh, this turns around and is also routed through a Lambda, which then reads from the database and now gets that information, sends it all the way back to HipChat Connect. So uh, I, I got started on all of this using an uh, AWS wizard for Lambda. And it goes really fast until you want to put all your code under source control. Uh, then at that point, you have to unwind a lot of work to see what AWS did magically. But it's still a helpful starting point. So to do the, you know, if you're still learning AWS services like I am, uh, then it helped me get familiar with API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB, logging, permissions, all in context of a real working application before I turned it into a code repository. The Lambda code itself can be quite small. Uh, so here's a, a small example. I tend to prefer uh, Python, but it's also possible to write Java or JavaScript. It accepts just an event and a context. Context is stuff that you've set up about the Lambda itself, like information maybe coming in from how it's wired up to uh, the API gateway. Uh, and the event is all of that information taken from API Gateway or from the message queue and packaged up so that this Lambda can read it. The event payload depends heavily on what is triggering it. So you, you end up with a, with a pretty tight coupling between the, the source and the Lambda that you have. Uh, and now it's easy to put this code under source version control. I could have co copied and pasted it out of the AWS uh, GUI, but it's equally important to capture the configuration around it. If that's not under version control, then it's very hard to reproduce. In fact, uh, there's way more code with regard to the configuration than there is that does the processing itself. So that's where AWS CloudFormation comes in. It's the AWS service for spinning up other services. Uh, it's often in kind of this orchestration role and, uh, and since it, it, it establishes all the connections between services, that's, that's all determined at this level. So now I can put under, uh, everything under version control, including the configuration. I had to start over writing these things from, cloud form, from the CloudFormation perspective. Uh, this makes it much more repeatable delivery. CloudFormation can spin up every kind of AWS resource except, sadly, API Gateway. And for that, I, I, you, you really have to write some custom code. There are some libraries and things that you can grab, but that's uh, one of the more painful parts of this at this point in time. OK, so now we switch views. We, the view that I showed before was how, uh, how information flows through the, th the different AWS services during runtime. But for a build time, I used Bitbucket and Pipelines. Uh, so this helps me bootstrap. I had Python code for, for lambdas, uh, for example, that need to go into a zip. And then I have to publish those with the cloud formation, the full cloud formation template. And uh, so Bitbucket and Pipelines do some of that initial work. Uh, they make a, uh, a, a pretty basic curl call to push things up to S3, which is uh, where is basic uh, file storage in the AWS world. Uh, then when uh, changes are detected there, AWS Lambda, again, comes into the picture and is triggered. Uh, it runs the CloudFormation template, pulling the zips into the Lambda, and uh, this makes it possible for uh, anybody to pretty much fork a repository and uh, achieve the same, uh, uh, the same configuration at the end. 
So there's a couple other services I'll quickly mention here that are important. They're just kind of in the landscape and you would hit them sooner or later. Uh, one of them is the identity and access management. I think that's what IAM stands for. It's the piece that allows, uh, that, that establishes permissions between the different services. Uh, and then there's another piece, the CloudWatch logs. And if you really want to understand how all of this configuration is running at any given point in time, you really have to be able to understand uh, the, the logs from all of those services. And so the, the CloudWatch is really a way to aggregate all of that information together. All right, so does that sound complicated? It's like, why would I use these AWS services to solve this kind of problem? You know, like, why would I suffer to learn all these things anyway? And what does this have to do with Connect? <laughs> Uh, so there is this problem of, of, or you know, like this promise in the cloud of this idea that is no ops. I don't know if folks have heard that, or you know, or the term in my title is serverless, and, and both can be a little bit misleading because, like this picture, uh, we can see parts of it sticking out of the cloud, but we know somewhere down there there are real servers. Uh, so we have to remember that the cloud is somebody else's computer. Uh, now, but once we know that, we, you know, like we want to see how much we can build on top of that promise anyway and, and, uh, and understand. So that's why my experiment uh, you know, was, was, was focused on this area. And I think there were three things that I really learned from this that relate to the Connect folks. So one is configuration as code. And for the Connect world, uh, this is really interesting because this means that you have a way that you can distribute a Connect add-on without necessarily having to run it all yourself. Uh, so I know if folks are P2 developers, that's a mode that you're used to delivering some, some plugins with, uh, this might be a useful stage to, to have for Connect as well. So, um, you know, really serverless should mean that I never have to go to a server GUI or command line to get under the hood. Everything I need is specified as code, something that runs, uh, especially the configuration. So I think this means uh, a number of things. One, I can apply design principles to the configuration itself, like don't repeat yourself, single rep responsibility principle, and uniform levels of abstraction. I can use version control to branch, merge, or do peer reviews. That's also important for configuration. I can automate testing and deployment. And I can document with comments and read me to all the people so they can understand it too. So that includes for configuration. Uh, now, so although CloudFormation is the AWS service for this, you could use tools like Terraform or Ansible. So it's not a particular recommendation for, for uh, CloudFormation. Uh, but then, yeah, okay, so we come back to Connect and anyone can run it. It doesn't have to be you. That's, that's an important thing for, uh, for Connect. If you are just starting developing an idea, maybe you want other people to try it out without having to run this infrastructure yourself. And so configuration as code is very important to, to being able to distribute this to other people. Uh, going serverless also means going with microservices. And uh, monoliths are probably better suited to virtualization where you still have more control over hardware and software configuration. In the world of microservices, there are still things that you have to configure. In, indeed, if you really could see the amount of cloud formation code there is, uh, configuration is almost like the, the sole burden that you have in the microservice world. Uh, so there's a lot to do on that side. To a large extent, uh, AWS already factors many of these things into microservices. So that big, you know, overwhelming chart there is is, is a whole lot of services. You have storage and database and queues, uh, but you still need to roll your own services in the mix to have the behaviors of your specific domain. Lambdas are those roll your own microservices, at least in the AWS world. Uh, but this can be co confusing for two reasons. Uh, first, nobody mentions microservices without Docker, right? So now I've just done it. Um, if you really need it, uh, there is a new AWS service for Docker called uh, EC2 Container Service, or ECS. Uh, it's what Bitbucket Pipelines uses under the hood for its Docker support. Uh, but you can do microservices without Docker, and that's what uh, Lambda is there for. Second, Lambdas don't follow the definition of microservices as an HTTP service. Uh, so you can make Lambdas respond to HTTP by adding API Gateway, but you don't have to. 
And in my experiment, I also use Lambda to respond to events from uh, the, uh, the, the command queue, and, and so there are other, or, or the S3 bucket. So there are other things that it can do in, in its own services world. And, uh, and then, you know, Lambdas can even be triggered by DynamoDB changes. So in a way, uh, that's, a, that's a way that DynamoDB could have almost database views, even though they're actually writing the data out to DynamoDB. But I think the most important aspect about, uh, about why serverless connect is so interesting is, is really the business model. So one of the things that I really like about this is that it's very cheap to go into production. So I can put something out there. It costs only the amount of S3 space that I'm using because until people are actually running it, uh, it, it, it really doesn't consume uh, very much cost at all. So scaling up is simple because lambdas will auto scale with the amount of traffic as the, as the queue increases. I only really pay for compute time, so that's a, a, a very linear increase as, as things scale up. Uh, and, and that's really even better overhead than what you get with auto-scaling virtual machines, which still at least need one running, so there's a, an ongoing cost. Uh, and they can take time to spin up more when there is a spike. And for you know, very small changes or very quick spikes, uh, that, that, that may be just too coarse-grained than with Lambda. Uh, but also, if I want to keep things cheap uh, with uh, API gateway as the front end, I can even limit demand so that I can keep it a free service uh, by rate limiting the API itself. So what does this mean for Connect? It means everyone can start with little or no cost. And I think that's a very important thing for, for Connect developers. You can run a cheap experiment to see if anyone's interested in the problem you're solving. Uh, in the spirit of Lean Startup, you don't even have to know the full business model before you start. You can really put this thing out there and have the safety to discover the right model uh, because your starting costs are so low and so is the cost of change. So AWS is not the uh, only vendor. I, it's not the only game in town. I, I used it because Atlassian is already heavily vested in AWS. Google and Azure have all of the same capabilities, even if named and grouped slightly differently. Uh, there are also dedicated niche services for each of these parts. Lambda has actually uh, equivalents to many other services out in the, uh, the cloud world, so you can take a best of breed approach if that suits you better. Uh, so, but with all of the competitive options, this serverless approach will just get better with, uh, with time and, and cheaper, and eventually, I hope you give it a try. So, thank you. I'll open for a question, or maybe two.